Well, ladies and gentlemen, you, you probably heard enough of me this morning, but um, I hope you've felt that the whole of the day has kept you uh, interested and info better informed about the world horse welfare than before. So thank you for joining us, um, and I hope that you'll have lots of interesting messages to take away with you. Feel supported in your own levels of interest. Um, and also the comfort of knowing that in spite of what has been a very difficult year for most charities, that World Horse Welfare has been able to maintain its income during 2009. Well, that says a huge amount for our supporters and that's you and an awful lot more people out there. So hopefully where our communications are working well and we are getting a message across, it, it, it doesn't stop as a form of entertainment, getting your message across, but it does show that we have a good message. It is well put. Uh, we can back it up with facts and we can sh prove to people that we can make a dis difference. And maybe that's why we've been able to do that. And the messages that we take from today, will, I hope will add to our ability to continue to raise funds. The horse transport always seems to me to be that a, a, an ability to, for people who are responsible owners, can't quite believe, bring themselves to believe that this level of uh, abuse still continues. Or indeed, that as we've noticed in, in the map, that the number of abattoirs available en route would seem to mean that, you know, it seemed to be wasting a huge amount of money just in transport when it would seem to be cheaper and easier and more efficient for everybody if they actually went to more local abattoirs. I also spotted the fact that there didn't seem to be very many abattoirs in the UK um, who would fulfill that role, and we know that even that is an issue um, here. And we aren't squeaky clean on this, and it's a balance that we have to maintain and sometimes we get reminded of that by the work that we see going on elsewhere. The level of interest in the training in Lesotho uh, remind us of that. And in Romania, where the take up on the, of the offers for help are, are so encouraging in terms of their understanding of the difference it will make. And sometimes I find that that's a, a less easy message to get across here, uh, rather more of the science than the welfare. And it's that balance that is absolutely critical for us to be able to strike. And sometimes it's easier when it is linked to your welfare and in the human context. Uh, if you have a vested interest in terms of the horse as part of your life, uh, then your ability to see what difference it makes is easier than it is for those who just see it as part of the scenery, uh, leisure activity, um, just nice to look at where the society has changed in its relationship to the horse sometimes changes that ability uh, to judge what is really good for them. And maybe that's partly to do with the, the overweight issue. Uh, and I would, we, we talked about this earlier in terms of research and, and the importance of education, but it's also worth mentioning that I think the con contribution of charities, not just horse, uh, World Horse Welfare, but other charities, to these research subjects uh, around horses is absolutely paramount. And I think the individuals who respond uh, and make it possible to do the research, most of that is through charities. And they make a huge impact. And for that, you know, we, we, are, we mustn't forget that the, those are, you're partly represented here, but there's a much wider group of people out there who do take that part of the research seriously. I would have to say, of course, as fundamentally a farrier, that there's no foot, no horse, but I don't want to get involved in that. Um, we were with the saddlers yesterday, they're extremely important. Um, the, uh, the education issue, I think we have highlighted today, and practically every subject we've touched on has a relationship to education, either at, in terms of the research end or in the much more basic end, where you start to become an owner and at what point nowadays you can install that degree of knowledge uh, and education into anybody who owns horses. I think we've all, and you've heard me say this before, I mean, the society has changed enough that, that maybe the, you thought you knew what there was to know about horses, 
because you've grown up in that environment. But things change. Now you're, um, the ability to buy into horse owning because you, that's something you'd like to do without any background uh, in animal keeping uh, provides a, a different uh, canvas to start um, work on and a different level of education. Um, education is, is training, training for life, and, and however that uh, affects you. Uh, knowledge, huge amounts of knowledge are acquired, but it is acquired. Nobody is born with that knowledge, and it really doesn't matter how clever we get. We've got to start somewhere, and that applies to all subjects, and, and animal welfare is no different in that sense. The fact that you may be able to cure things in terms of diseases or you may even have vaccinations available, doesn't stop the need for very basic knowledge uh, to start at the beginning for most people. Uh, uh, and that's something that we mustn't forget, and I think it's a role we may have to continue to play for a very long time yet. The fact that we do this, and we keep reminding ourselves of that value, is where horse welfare, world horse welfare actually works because in all those countries where we're making an impact, it is at a level which reminds us just how valuable all those basic uh, entry points are. And that if you do that well, and if you do it at a level which is truly understandable and affordable, and they can succeed being sustained in the long run, you are really making a difference in the long run. We've also started new international training programs, which is, a, a, we can only do with continued levels of support. To be able to maintain the programs that we already had in place has been um, successful enough uh, in terms of this year's fundraising, but to start a new international project is even more important. And one in Senegal is, is an exciting project, slightly different area. So that's six countries we're working in. And hopefully they are also countries which can spread their work uh, from within because they're beginning to grow the knowledge and affect their neighbors, who will see what a difference it makes. Now, we've also got things to look forward to, um, and in fundraising terms, that's always important, and in this case, it's a really important one, because uh, the Mitsubishi Motors Badminton Horse Trials um, have accepted us the, as the charity of the year next year. Now, I've just, funnily enough, been in with one charity who's already had that uh, privilege, and they did make the point about what an enormous success it was from their perspective. But it required an awful lot of extra people to make that opportunity truly worthwhile. So it's having enough people on the ground um, who can take advantage of that opportunity that will really make the difference. But I think perhaps we ought to say thank you to Hugh Thomas, who's with us today for giving us this wonderful opportunity. I'm sure it's not entirely his decision. <laughs> uh, probably not entirely his decision, but I'm sure he has a lot to do with that decision-making process, so thank you very much indeed. Um, planning has already started in earnest, but um, if probably today is quite a good moment to start if you're interested or might be at Babington uh, and would be able, available to help. The, one of the ass, assets of that particular um, event, um, and again was mentioned um, by the charity I was talking about, was that it did get the name out and the awareness out to a much greater number of people. We do take for granted, and perhaps Badminton is a classic example, that we do take for granted that people who go to Badminton will already be aware of World Horse Welfare and other horse charities. And it may be that that's true in terms of just the name, but they may not be aware uh, um, of just how much those individual charities do. And this is a really good uh, opportunity for us to be able to uh, make that point and to bring home the figures. Again, the assumption by either modern livestock owners or um, members of the public might be that transport of horses for slaughter is just a very small number. And when you're, you get a grip of the fact that that's 100,000 a year, that is a slightly different issue. 
And these are the things that we need to get across, those really basic figures that will raise that profile of the issues that little bit higher. And it'll give us a much better chance of, of promoting our appeals, getting people on the side, signing um, petitions, writing more letters to MEPs and uh, other politicians. That's a really important part of what we're asking and, and an opportunity that uh, we can take. So we look forward to that opportunity very much indeed. Um, I would add, of course, that badminton's always worth visiting uh, as an event. And there are all sorts of other things you can do there. But it is a perfect opportunity to promote world horse welfare. And I hope we shall be able to make the best possible use of that opportunity. And I hope today will, will help us do that, um, again, to raise the issues and the understanding of those issues. But more importantly, what World Health Welfare has already achieved measurably and what we know we can achieve in the future. Thank you.